Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Reducing OPEX in Oil and Gas with AI Predictive Analytics. My name is Megan Finkeldy and I'll be the facilitator for the event today. Um, and we'll just wait a few minutes as we just wait for our audience to join our room. And as we wait for everyone to join our room, we'd like to start by running a small poll to learn how our audience today is using operational data. So I'll just start a poll. And welcome to those that are joining us. Okay, so the poll has just started. If you've just joined us, we'd like to hear from you. How are you currently using operational data? Is it for condition monitoring, post-event analysis, data science projects, predictive maintenance, um, or integrated with a historian? I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer that one, and then that will help us um, understand where you're at and so we can um, tailor the presentation today. And then I'll run over the agenda for today's webinar and introduce our speaker to you, Mr. Arvind Chetty. So our presentation today will run for approximately 30 minutes and will be followed by a short Q&A session. If you have any questions during the presentation, we'd ask that you enter them into the chat here um, on the right-hand side and we'll do our best to address those questions at the end of the presentation today. The event will be recorded for those that are unable to join us in the live event. Um, and a link will be sent afterwards. Um, now to introduce our speaker, Mr. Arvin Chetty. So we are privileged to hear from Arvin today, who brings to us a wealth of energy industry experience, along with a master's of science degree in mechanical engineering. And during his four decades in the industry, he has held technical roles worldwide for companies, including Skarna Corporation and Schlumberger, following which he switched to focus to business development. Arvind is still actively involved in the oil and gas community, mentoring graduates and students, and is passionate about solving client process and reliability problems using innovative AI technology. So I think we've um, hopefully got some results coming in through the poll. I'll leave that up for a little bit longer and we'll publish those at the end of the webinar. Um, and over to you, Arvind. Thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us and others who are waiting for the recording because they're in Europe and, and North America. So I'm going to take you through the um, presentation rather quickly um, so that you can get a sense of what I'm trying to convey and then we can spend more time on the Q&A session so that we could really um, uh, look at specific issues and things that are particularly uh, 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 sensitive to you or things that you want to ask me. I'm 100% sure I won't be able to answer all your questions, but I'm also very sure that I'll be able to get back to you with the answers at some point. So as soon as we're ready to start with the presentation, we'll uh, go ahead. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is reducing OPEX in oil and gas with AI predictive analytics. Um, that's uh, been a reducing OPEX in oil and gas, the top line, has been an issue ever since I came into the industry. Um, there's been a lot of knee jerk reaction to reducing OPEX because uh, people tend to cut the things that are easy to do. Uh, no coffee in the coffee room, no biscuits for the employees. Those are the easy OPEX reduction activities. But to be able to make good OPEX reduction or change decisions, um, you need to have good tools to do it. Um, we've had a long history of, of OPEX reduction using uh, many different types of things, uh, including technology. What AI has done is actually brought a new and a paradigm shift to how you can use that information uh, to make better judgments. What I will also say is that AI does not replace I. 
intelligence is still required when dealing with anything to do with AI. And what AI is, does really well is provide a good decision-making support for stakeholders to be able to uh, make good decisions well ahead of time. So those are the two things, good decision because you have good information and well ahead of time because of the predictive nature of AI and the way it's set up. <clears throat> A quick introduction about VROC, that, uh, that's the company that I'm working for. We're based in Western Australia. It was uh, born and brought up here about six to seven years ago. And one of the unique things about them is that they looked at uh, machine learning in a different way. There's a lot of effort spent in writing algorithms that uh, allow data sets to understand themselves. Uh, and what VROC has done has automated that process so that very, very large amounts of data can be brought together very quickly uh, and understood by our platform. So because of the nature of, uh, of the system, the technology is not offered as a consultancy, but rather as a software, as a service. And, and that is a huge, um, I would say, advantage to customers because they can build their own models using very simple drop-down menus. So when we say VROC is AI for engineers, that is actually true, uh, but it's also AI for accountants or technicians or anybody else who can actually uh, uh, use drop-down menus. So while our genesis has been in oil and gas, uh, purely by the nature of our background, we are now working in many different industries, including mining, power, uh, smart facilities and cities, um, We're going into shipping and agriculture. And uh, typically, all of these are process industries where you have time-based data uh, coming into the system very, very quickly. So I just wanted to make sure that we all understood what we're talking about when, when we talk about OPEX. So typically, OPEX is what is shown in that lower half and it includes the maintenance which is where most of us when we talk about opex most of us are talking about reducing maintenance costs but there's a lot of fixed and variable costs and overheads that have to be taken into consideration and these are all linked together and then there are some general expenses which are incurred by the organization to just keep things going and all of this is part of the oil and gas uh, financial model So OPEX reduction is not more critical today than it was before, but it is under a lot of different kind of pressures. And these pressures we haven't seen as much before. The instability in oil price has always been there, but now it is so much more unstable because uh, things can move very quickly uh, in, in the way we work. There's a lot of pressure from, from uh, greenhouse gas um, uh, emission issues. So there are a lot of new technologies that have come into play that are put, putting pressure on uh, how we actually use fossil fuels. And thirdly, the, the pandemic has actually revealed some really interesting things about how we can actually work from home uh, but some of us that are lucky, but most of us in the oil and gas industry have to show up at a plant or an offshore facility and actually do something. And so there is a lot of pressure on being able to reduce the number of people that have to be exposed, uh, not only to the risk of, of going to the facility, but also the risk of contracting uh, other diseases. And in many countries, especially Western countries, uh, the manpower has been a significant part of the OPEX reduction strategy. So let's look at some really interesting insights uh, from Rystad Energy that came out last year. So UK, which is the one you see on the, uh, on the, on the chart, which goes up to 2014 and then drops down, uh, reduced their um, cost us dollar cost per barrel from about 30 to 16 dollars and the reason for that was mainly two things one is that a lot of their old facilities 
were shut down during these five years. And the new facilities that came online had a lower um, cost per barrel, uh, but also had lower maintenance costs. Right? Some of that reduction was also, I must admit, in deferred uh, maintenance. So we may see this graph climb in the future, but so far they seem to be doing all right. Uh, on the other hand, you can see that countries like Norway have been pretty steady. They have reduced their cost per barrel, but you can see Mexico has actually increased their cost per barrel. And that's purely coming from old assets uh, requiring more maintenance and having uh, greater risk. Okay. The next graph is actually even more interesting. While these countries have either reduced, uh, all of them have reduced their cost per barrel, in local currency terms, Angola, Nigeria, and Mexico have massive increases uh, on their cost uh, per barrel. And this is purely because of the change in the monetary value of their currency against the US dollar. So this is putting inordinate pressures on them locally, uh, whereas in the international market, they may look really good. Uh, locally, it's putting a lot of pressures on them uh, in terms of their own uh, economy. So reducing OPEX is not a very, not a simple equation of just reducing uh, cost per barrel. It really depends on where you are. So what are the major components of OPEX based on production? So let's just focus on the production aspects. There are many things in that basket, but let's just focus on things that um, are more visible and and have greater impact. So there are the variable costs which we see all the time, which is the cost of the oil or gas uh, coming into the system, the uh, which is coming from the old exploration costs, the cost of labor, utilities, supplies, and maintenance. So these are the variable costs. But then we have the time-dependent costs, which are very, very significant, and the shutdowns, inspections, upgrade, replacements, and life extension are becoming a huge issue and being able to change that interval or uh, decrease the amount of time you do these activities has a huge impact on OPEX. But then there are some fixed costs which are based on the money that you've already spent and we are not going to focus on them at, as much at the moment. So where does AI come in on these OPEX management strategies? So everything that I have highlighted in bold is where we can actually add value with AI. Um, from labor all the way to life extension, uh, AI can pr provide some useful insights that allow you to reduce the cost of operating the asset. So let's see how AI actually works. Uh, many of you know AI really well, uh, but I'll I'll just give you a little bit of an insight into what is happening, what we are seeing happening in the industry. We've come from a place where there was not enough data or hardly any data to a, a place where we have too much data. Uh, 500 gigabytes from a single gas turbine compressor blade is just crazy amount of data. And that's because of how much data is being gathered and how often it's being sampled. If you get 17 terabytes of data from a from a pipeline uh, infrastructure, you know? Uh, what are you going to do with it? 500 gigabytes of data from one blade multiplied by all the blades on your compressors, what are you going to do with it? And what McKinsey has found is that the production potential of an average offshore production platform, according to them, uh, the maximum that people are realizing is only 77%. So we're leaving 23% on the table. I, I agree that we, you know it's hard to achieve 100%, but 77% for a mature industry is not that fantastic. And, and the reason is that collecting data is not enough. You need to be able to do something with it. And we are actually struggling to use that data to predict future pay failures and performance. Uh, and more importantly, uh, the only way you can do that is to determine the root cause. And here's where AI plays a huge role. So let me just contrast AI with uh, the types of modeling done in AI versus uh, traditional uh, modeling methods. 
So if you look at condition-based monitoring or a, a, a specific model, so I have a problem with a compressor. I'm going to get all the data from that compressor and uh, do, may build some machine learning algorithms, come up with a solution, figure out what's going on, implement those solutions, and then I'm going to move on to another asset. Um, holistic modeling is completely different. In holistic modeling, um, you gather all the data from every single sensor. Now, the AI system doesn't actually know what this data is. But what it actually, what it figures out using the machine learning algorithms is that there is a connection between these data points. And it figures out the connections. If you look at that particular process plant, you've got the input all the way to the gas flaring, to the liquids output, to the water uh, output. All of these are actually connected and you can't separate one from the other. You can't shut off production in one well and have no impact on anything else. It's just not possible. You can take any one of these items out of the equation and it's going to have an impact somewhere else. And AI, manages to figure that out. So seemingly unconnected processes have interrelated problems. And that is the real way that AI is able to figure out the root causes. So your root cause may be somewhere upstream or downstream of where your asset is. And that's why holistic modeling is becoming so important. But in order to do holistic modeling, uh, you need to have a platform that is able to do it efficiently. So the traditional data analytics really is just shown on the top row. And this is where most companies are that have invested heavily in data scientists. Okay, no disrespect to data scientists, but this is the model that they've used is I've got a problem. I'm going to get the data for the problem. I'm going to clean the data, structure it, and I'm going to build models that understand how this data works. And then I'll evaluate that model and see if it's given me an understanding of what my problem is. And I'll go keep doing that till I find a solution, then put it into production, and then go and start on another problem. That is our traditional way of doing things. And most of the companies actually are still using that method. It is inefficient, um, but it also takes a lot of time and a lot of manpower. So it's a very uh, manpower based method and it relies a lot on the ability of the data scientists. So VROC has taken a completely different approach. They have figured out a way that the data, all the data comes in, not only from a specific asset, but from all sources, even external sources like the weather, the ocean currents, whatever, you think may have an impact on your asset all comes into a single platform and once it does that the system starts modeling the data now one of the most critical things about this is that we're also able to ingest real-time data with the historical data whereas in the traditional data analytics you're typically tied to historical data to try and solve problems because every time real-time data comes in it disrupts your model so we take all of this data together, aggregate it, and it's continuously being aggregated. And what the system does is very interesting. The system tries to understand how your asset actually works. So your asset has a steady state. It may have different steady states depending on how many wells you have in production, whether you're offloading, whether you're doing different things. And at each stage, it understands how the whole system works. And it understands where things need to be. And when things change, it understands that that is a deviation. And that's how the platform actually figures out what's going on. But very interestingly, we don't tell it what the dependencies are. We don't say that the output of a compressor is dependent on the input of the compressor because we, the model, the system itself figures all of those things out based on the sensors. And sometimes we don't have the sensors. And in that case, it has to go and figure out from other sensors that are available. And if it doesn't have that 
support, then the reliability of the result is lower. And it tells you that the reliability is lower because they don't have enough information. So that's really how an automated machine learning system uh, works differently from a traditional data analytics system. Very interestingly, this whole system is completely scalable enterprise-wide, so you can keep adding assets to it and it will keep growing and the amount of data that it can take on. So a lot of focus actually has been on data aggregation and data ingestion. So how does it all work? So we take in data from external sources, historical sources, historical data, as well as live data into our AI platform. And then the customer actually decides what they want to do with the data. So they can go in and build models to do all kinds of things. They can say, I want to know uh, when my plant is going to drop in production. I want to know when my turbine is going to fail. Uh, I want to know when um, sand production is likely to happen. Um, Pretty much any question that you can ask, the system will try to answer, and it'll tell you how good its answer is based on the quality of data that it has, okay? You can also overlay your risk matrix on this so that you can prioritize the results and, and display them, but you can also report anything that you want out of the system. So this is a quick snapshot of, of the AI platform. It's really catering the data is yours. The system sets up a platform so that you can do whatever you would like to do with the data. You can also actually overlay physics-based models on this data. So you can calculate your steam curves, your uh, contrast, the actual performance of a pump with the actual pump curves that the OEM has given you. So right from startup all the way to, to end of life, this system can look at how your asset is behaving and compare it to whatever model that you, you've previously used. So how do we reduce OPEX using this system? There are many different ways that we do it. Um, I will show you one particular thing, which is our predictive tool. Now, if you look at this particular graph, you can see this was a historical data that was given to us to model and find out if we could predict when a particular turbine failed. So we modeled, the orange is the actual overlay of our modeling. So 14 days before the failure, we were able to model when this turbine would fail. However, using the SCADA and DCS, this is where they were able to model about a few hours or minutes before the turbine failed. So we had 14 days notice that the system would fail. Now, not only that, we would give um, root causes of what those failures were, because typically it's not one single thing, it's multiple things. And what we also predicted is after they started up the turbine, uh, that it would fail again, and it did. And again, because they were always fixing the immediate cause, not the root cause. So this is the power of AI looking at a turbine as part of the whole plant rather than as a turbine itself and being able to predict uh, failures. <clears throat> so equipment degradation, root cause analysis, uh, and being able to tell you when things are going to fail is one of the greatest, uh, I would say, um, uh, advantages of using AI. The issue is not that other systems will not tell you something is going to fail. The issue is how much before it can tell you when things are going to fail. And that time is absolutely critical in bringing the right people, the right spares, and using mitigation techniques to reduce your uh, costs. Even more importantly, the root cause analysis provides a histogram of the most likely things that are going to fail. Now, if you remember what I said, AI without I is totally useless. 
what this actually does is give you a very, very, very strong decision making tool so that subject matter experts and people on the ground who know the systems are able to look at this information and make the right decisions. It does not tell you 100% this is the problem. It tells you this is most likely the problem based on what I'm seeing. And as it sees this problem more often, it's able to predict even further in the future and give you a higher confidence level of the failure. And that, that is the nature of AI. It's, it's really about modeling and statistics. Normally, when we use uh, our analytics on, on a customer's um, asset, the first few months are spent only on monitoring and doing predict predictive analytics. And once they're quite happy that things are going as they planned, then they become uh, more adventurous and say, listen, um, you've already managed to save us money by doing all of these things. Now we want to optimize some of the processes. And this is another great advantage of, of, uh, of AI, of our system. We can look at the process as a whole, use some data science tools and uh, apply them to different processes and different outcomes to see where things are actually shaping up. And a lot of that is really dependent on uh, the information that we have. So for example, um, one of the uh, clients recently, they had given us a lot of uh, data on their uh, um, pipelines. And using the, the Jupyter Notebooks um, analysis, we were able to figure out what was causing the corrosion and uh, something that they had missed because it was actually completely contraindicatory to what they thought it was. So some of these insights are really amazing. Um, what The other one was for a power plant where we had two processes. Now just imagine you have two gas trains uh, that are exactly the same. They're performing differently and you feed this information into our system. Within an hour or so, you're able to figure out why one system is totally different from the other and it'll tell you what the most important aspects are and then some of the other aspects that are contributing to the same thing so process optimization is actually a growing business for us uh, because everyone is already um, assumes that we can do the predictive and the uh, degradation monitoring So the third one, which is being able to look at things globally. So this is an enterprise example for one of our clients. And it essentially the model is based on four aspects. They wanted to know how their oil, water, uh, CO2, uh, and uh, I think the third one was gas. Oil, water, gas, and CO2, how those four things were working for them on different plants all over the world. Now, this is one of the largest multinationals uh, in oil and gas. And this is a real snapshot of their assets, which shows at a high level to a global asset manager, which assets are performing well or doing fine and which assets are actually um, need urgent work and others which are orange are those that have potential issues that need to be tackled. And all of this information can be seen on a computer screen, any web-based system on your phone, all the way down to the uh, detailed analytics of each equipment that is actually being flagged. So using our system a day in the life of an asset manager really looks like uh, wake up in the morning, have a look at my asset dashboard, see which systems I need to work on, prioritize them, set up the work orders, and make sure the work orders are executed, then check and see if they have actually been fixed. Now, our system can also output 
work orders and things like that. So we can go the whole extent of actually feeding into a SAP or a CMMS or any other ERP type system you're using to manage your plant, uh, or we can do it completely independently. We can also completely replicate uh, your uh, historian because our system actually um, takes data from the historian, but then becomes the historian itself. And you can scroll things back and forth. You can overlay all the data on a 3D model if you're using uh, 3D modeling. Uh, it's completely up to you. That's uh, how you display the data. It's totally up to you. We can provide you the uh, information to do that. But what it actually does for an asset manager is gives them a lot of visibility on what's happening with their asset, where they need to focus rather than everywhere, uh, and get things fixed quickly. Now, when I go through the, the uh, case history, you'll see how that has actually impacted uh, a particular asset. So the end-to-end -end value chain literally is that the AI models that are already in production uh, provide an end-to-end -end value chain. So they look at everything that you want to see. And if you have a drop, for example, in the output, you can actually see where that, what the main reason for that drop is in that whole system that you are, you have uh, before the uh, custody transfer pump. And then you can intervene on the most important part of that to avoid the drop in production. And then once that changes, the models then uh, automatically adjust to then start predicting uh, future production or future condition of your asset. So that's really how a holistic modeled automated uh, machine learning platform works. So let's have a look at a North Sea case study, uh, which had late life offshore platforms. So there were two offshore platforms, um, probably two or three years to go. You can see from their condition, they're not new. Um, these are some of the oldest platforms in the North Sea. And last year, they, uh, they had a problem. In February last year, um, the pandemic hit and they were not able to mobilize their reliability engineers who were very critical to their uh, uptime and maintenance efforts. So they had to stay onshore they had no visibility uh, to be able to work from onshore and have a look really at their assets. So they asked us to implement our platform. It took us about a week to ingest all the data uh, from their historian and then start gathering real-time data. And we set up the live feed. We set up the uh, initial models. And after that, we trained the reliability engineers um, and the asset managers to build their own models, to look at the things that they wanted to do. And we provided support throughout that period. So what were the outcomes? So on the personnel side, the first thing is they, they had visibility from shore. They didn't have to mobilize offshore, but more importantly, they were able to see failures before they happened. So this was actually a, um, a water injection pump. And this was not an old pump, it was a new pump. And we started to see a degradation in performance of one of the pumps. Um, we found that the degradation of performance was actually coming from the uh, seal, water seal. And you can see the histogram at the bottom. It actually shows you the root causes and what their contribution is. So this is a normalized histogram showing you uh, what it thinks are the main causes of that failure. Now, what this enabled them to do is actually have minimum manning offshore, uh, and they were able to do the mitigation activities, but then the right personnel could go offshore uh, with the correct spares, fix the problem, and come back. So things could be done in a much more organized, planned manner because they had time, they had visibility, and they knew the root cause. On the major trips that they were having, so this is really a graph 
showing the major asset trips in 2019 versus what they had in 2020. Okay, so if you notice the first trip in 2020 was in January before the platform, before they started using AI. And after that, the number of trips and the impact of the trips has been very, very small. And a lot of times these trips, although we were warned them in advance, there was nothing they could do about it because other systems are also in play. So there's significant change in reliability of their asset. But more importantly, um, anything that happened was actually known to them in advance. So they could be prepared for that. The third one, which is very interesting, is this is where the optimization comes in. So before that, we looked at monitoring, we looked at predictions, but now let's look at optimization. So one of the issues that they had was uh, their system was not completely automated to take care of everything. So they were actually uh, getting too much uh, oil in the injection water and discharge water. And you know that discharge water, you're not allowed to discharge more than 30 ppm of oil. So what they had to do was figure out how they could manage um, their separator levels, their flows from the wells and other things to make sure they were always in compliance because once they went out of compliance, they had to shut down the plant and, and rectify the problem and then report it and then find the root causes, do all of that. So we started building these models where we looked at how the system was behaving and what we could change without actually changing it, what we could change on the system, which would affect other parts of the plant. And slowly over a matter of time, you can see in the last two graphs is we are saving them 100% of the time. We're able to tell them in advance what needs to be done, uh, what mitigation factors have to be put in place to make sure that they're not in violation. So this is a huge negative um, cost to them, whereas they didn't incur the cost because they were able to predict and mitigate uh, compliance issues. And the same thing happens with flaring. You know, you can tell in advance, the same thing could happen with fouling on water injection uh, feed pumps to, uh, to, prevent fouling, or to prevent fouling on the heat exchangers and increase in pressure across the filters. So these were the three main outcomes. Now let's look at the results. So these results are uh, have actual numerical values attached to them, which were given by the client, not made up by us, right? They only talk about the direct savings that they had, not about the indirect savings, all right? So they had a huge amount of savings. So this is over nine months, okay? Uh, 1.8 million pounds from one asset and 431,000 pounds from another asset. But look at the reduction in losses, 83% reduction in losses in terms of barrels of uh, oil and 80% in the other, which are not counted as part of this. This was just the direct cost. So the savings are just the ROI on these types of uh, systems are huge. They are, um, you know, within a, a month, we were able to capture um, pretty much the cost for the next few years of, of any, any such implementation. And most importantly, the headline is actually improved decision making for better outcomes. And that is the thread that runs through this, all right? The AI didn't go and do anything. It actually provided them the correct insights in time to be able to do things to do to fix the problems and this is where i have to tell you the most important part of it you can implement any system you want but if you actually don't use it to make any changes then it's just another toy it's not of any use to you and you won't get any reduction other than you will have more people working on that system okay and that happens quite a lot as well so over the last year or so, these are the types of, of benefits we've seen from clients. And as our uh, footprint increases uh, globally, uh, we will start to see more and more and more.
<clears throat> so if you want to if you want to have sustained opex reduction right uh, the direct outcomes that you need to have are to increase reliability increase production reduce optimized maintenance uh, reduce and optimize maintenance personnel and reduce opex as a result so personnel maintenance optimization all three play a role uh, when ai is involved in reducing opex and it can be done on a sustained basis but it also requires subject matter experts maintenance operations people to work together as part uh, using this information to get the best out of their asset so in a predictive model this is literally where we're going right where we will be delivering uh, your uh, backup heart uh, because we know it's going to fail in the future and, and that's really the whole vision of of predictive uh, maintenance is to get there before you know you needed it so i'm going to stop uh, my presentation here and we can move on to questions um I haven't looked at any questions that people have put, put in, so uh, I'll let um, Megan jump in here and, and moderate. So thank you for listening to the presentation. Thank you, Arvind. That was very um, enlightening and interesting. Um, so we've got a few questions that have come through. Um, and first one is, what is the biggest or some of the biggest roadblocks experienced by clients in implementing this? Um, the biggest roadblocks are actually uh, internal roadblocks, which is, um, we ha I had this discussion just, just yesterday and one of the uh, potential partners asked, asked me, um, how do you convince your clients to use your system, right? And I've been through this whole gamut of, you know, we started off with uh, preventive maintenance. So you change your oil every 500 hours, you drain the water from your air tanks every day. Nobody questioned that and said, yep, that's fine, we'll do it. Then we went to all the three and four letter words, which was RCM, FMEA, CBM, everybody was happy with that. Nobody questioned it. We all adopted it and went on. Uh, with AI, it's more of a black box. And people tend to, people like me who've grown up in the old ways where things are based on physics, find it hard to switch to this. So that's, there's a mental roadblock there. There's an organizational roadblock, which is especially with the larger companies, They've already invested millions of dollars on data scientists that are not producing very many results. And now we're going to them and saying, hey, here's another AI thing for you to try. And they're like, we've already tried these millions of dollars worth of stuff. And so our potential roadblocks are the, uh, the investment in already made by companies in their own systems. And we're quite happy to actually um, do a, you know, a, a proof of concept to show them why we're different and why automated machine learning actually works differently. The other roadblock, which is even more interesting, is the country policies on data not being able to be sent outside uh, the country. So. Uh, because our system can be actually um, put anywhere. So we can be, if, for example, we are bidding on a work for Saudi Arabia and we can actually have our system sitting on Aramco servers. It doesn't actually have to be any particular place. So we're totally um, independent of uh, issues where everything has to come to us. Uh, things can be, things can be actually our system can be running on anybody's um, server racks. Okay, thank you. 
Um, another question that we've got is kind of where you were leading to then, I, I guess, is where do you suggest we start um, that the opportunities seem sort of, you, sort of it's quite broad? Where, where's the starting point, I guess, for implementation? The starting point of the implementation is, um, so if, if they're an asset owner, for example, uh, is to actually try it. There's no other way to, you need to actually first convince yourself, you need to convince your management, and the only way to do it is to try it. So it's very easy to actually sh prove this, is to have some historical data, probably six to nine months, and the data needs to be representative, which means that there needs to be failures in it and things that, that have happened to your system. And then tell people like us to predict those failures uh, using our system. And don't tell us what happened. Don't even tell us what the asset is, right? As long as you give us your, your tags and tell us, you know, uh, what type of issues you want us to model. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the best way to convince. And every single client we had uh, has been through that process. Nobody has said, yep, we believe you, you know, you're the greatest. Here, here we are, sign the contract. Everybody wants to know if it works for their system. Because a lot of our clients say we don't have enough data. And that's fine as well. We, we're able to do this with very little data sometimes. And and, uh, uh, and then we are able to tell you where to add sensors to improve your outcomes. So if you're having trouble with a compressor all the time and you have no data from the compressor, it's not going to be easy for AI to figure it out. It's, it's not possible. Okay. Um, we've got time for one last question, which just come through actually. Um, oh, there's a few coming through now. <laughs> what methodology does AI follow if remote sensors of the aging asset are not reliable anymore? Yes, so what happens is that um, we need to have some information from when they were reliable, okay? Because if all the system is seeing is unreliable data, then it can't model based it'll model based on the data that it has it can't make up the data for itself right but what it can do is show you that there's something wrong with the way this particular thing is behaving right now so first of all data needs to be representative now with aging assets what happens is that um they're going and taking down readings you know physically two times a day, four times a day. Uh, but if you have, you know, 10 years of those readings, that is data as well, okay? But it's a slow time-based data. It's not like, it's not instantaneous. So it really, you're gonna get what you put in to this system, but it's going to be able to do it much faster and much smarter than you could do it manually. Eventually, you know, um, you could solve any problem yourself. It's just whether you want to have it quicker, faster, and uh, prevent it from happening that you need AI. Okay. And if you could succinctly tell us, um, I've got a question that's come in, how AI machine learning and deep learning, how do they differ from one another? So here's, I can honestly answer that I have no idea because I'm not a data scientist, I'm an oil and gas engineer. So what I can do though, uh, I think that's Ahmed Farid has answered that question. We can actually get back to you on that. And I think there's another question from Praveen about database being very important and uh, how Pareto analysis helps in predicting root cause and bad actors. So of course, Pareto analysis is used by uh, AI, just like anything else. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It, it, it is used uh, the same way. All of these types of analytical tools are used by the AI system uh, to do it. Uh, but what it, what's able to do is it's able to do it in real time uh, and it's able to do it much faster. Right? So it provides you exactly the same type of thing. Now, just on the bad actors issue, I can also say uh, another thing. Um, 
when we have set points uh, for systems in SCADA and, and DCS, uh, those set points are based on how we think the system should be operating and where we think it's going to go out of danger. The beauty of AI and automated AI is it it's continuously, the way it figures out something is wrong, it's continuously calculating where uh, any particular point should be and telling you that it's either within tolerances of that point or it's deviating from that point. So for example, if you had a temperature uh, trip set for one degree above a certain point. When AI will start showing when it's 0 0.01 degrees and starting to trend, it'll say, this is going in the wrong direction. And it'll tell you that, and this could be two months before it actually gets to the one degree. So this is the big difference between um, how the bad actors are identified by the DCS and SCADA and how we start identifying them with automated machine learning. So ultimately, the process is the same. It's just the time difference is huge. Yeah, yeah, which gives you ample time to make a plan and mitigate. Yeah, but uh, there's one more aspect which I haven't, which I've mentioned before, which is that uh, a lot of the analysis that is done, uh, especially with Pareto analysis, is done um, using what we think are the factors affecting a particular asset. The way AI, automated AI works is it doesn't know. So it doesn't assume that things that are connected to that asset are the, because it doesn't know what's connected to that asset. It doesn't know that. So it actually figures out uh, the root cause based on any sensor that is actually affecting that asset. And that could be way upstream or a blockage downstream that is affecting it. It's able to do all of that. I hope that answers uh, that question. Um, we have had one last question. HVAC, yes, through. absolutely. Yes. It works perfectly for HVAC. This is the easiest thing. And I can, uh, if you contact me, Emma, I can send you some information separately for HVAC where you can set, uh, set everything or you can look at things based on um, any type of uh, uh, system you want. You want based on comfort, based on temperature, based on energy consumption. You can use it to do any of that. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we might um, wrap up there as we know time is precious. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today in this webinar. Thank you Arvind as well for your time. Um, and I guess I'll just say quickly any next steps. Um, we do have a case study on um, OPEC, reducing OPEX um, in late life assets, which is available for download um, on our website. So we'll add that link to the email that gets sent out um, after this, um, along with the live link as well. And, you know, Arvind is available as well as the team if anyone is interested in a demo and we can actually talk through and show you specifics. Obviously, today has been quite high level and um, we're talking about the concept. Um, but we're definitely uh, available to do demonstrations and talk to you about how it could be applied in your real situation. Um, so thank you again for your time. We do um, hope that you all have a great rest of your day and um, we look forward to connecting with you all again soon, um, either at another webinar or a similar event. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, Megan.